Hello. Go ahead. So hi everyone, my name is Melody Moheb, and as a disclaimer, I want to say that I work full time as an outreach assistant to the Member of Parliament for Port Moody Coquitlam, Benita Zorillo, she is. And um, so whatever I say here uh, is my own opinion. Um, number one thing that I wanted to talk about is that why um, I am doing politics in general, because my background is not politics. I didn't even do any, any kind of uh, social science um, at university. I've got two degrees, both in science. The first one was in general biology, which I got from Iran, Perdosi University of Mashhad. And then I came to uh, Canada, I assume, to become a doctor, like many other uh, Iranian kids growing up in um, with, with Iranian parents. So they think that they have to become a lawyer, engineer, or doctor. Uh, I was not in social science at all. However, I was always good at writing and uh, I always did enjoy reading. So I get here, I go to UBC to do another science degree and to you know, become a dentist or a doctor. And um, a year in, I feel like, um, well, maybe um, I am more into kind of science like nutritional science, which focuses on hunger issue around the world or environmental science, which also uh, focuses on environmental issues and they're kind of very related to politics. Um, so I decided to do international nutrition and uh, kind of become an activist in terms of, uh, in regards to a hunger issue and how we solve or improve the problem. Uh, but the year that I wanted to graduate, unfortunately, um, the, the whole program was discontinued. So I was graduated in another major. Um, and uh, well, but by the time I knew that this is what I want to do, I want to make differences in societies. Um, and uh, I joined different clubs. I volunteered here and there. Um, and I think the main reason why I chose politics over, for example, I don't know, like uh, social science or economics uh, was the fact that um, I come from a part of the world which um, when even when you leave the country and you go to another country to live in, the politics affects you a lot. Uh, all those negative uh, energy that was coming from uh, Iran, bad news is every day um, and uh, things that were happening to my people in Iran really affected me and I felt like I have to um, do something about it and I was I felt like people are very desperate even after immigration and they don't know how to solve the issue of coming from a dictatorship um, and how they can really, it, it's just even with the opposition of our government, um, Iranian government, it was all um, discretion and disappointment. And there was, I felt like there is no hope for people like, I mean, like there is hope you can leave your life, but there is no hope in, in regard of the fact that you can't, uh, you come from a culture, uh, ethnicity, a country that um, defines you and you feel something's badly wrong with it and you don't know how to fix it or is there any solution at all? So um, then I try to, you know, just, just read about it and uh, get involved uh, here and there. And based on my observation, I felt it sounds that part of it is culturally, we are very romantic. Like the, the, the Iranians culture is very romantic. So um, we even look at the governing system of our country very romantically. And um, that's why I felt we need a bit of system thinking here and we have to do something about it. Maybe maybe us that now are living out of the country and we have this privilege of being in a democracy. It's for us, it could be like an academy, like in 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week of uh, being in a university that teaches you uh, what is democracy and we can learn and we can teach. Uh, 
So yeah, so um, that's how I ended up choosing uh, politics over other social sciences. But um, honestly, to being able to analyze um, you know, po political situations and uh, incidents and, you know, news and everything, you have to have a bit of also background in economics and uh, in social science, in even statistics. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be, I mean, what you say there out there is going to be kind of very biased. Um, so um, I I'm trying to educate myself. Uh, at one point, I have to go back to school, I guess. I, I want to go back to school and study. Uh, political economics, but uh, for now I am practicing uh, um, politics um, in a very, uh, you know, it's just on daily basis uh, in real life because that's my job. Um, I work at, at the constituency office, a member of parliament, um, and I have to have that analytical, analytical view regarding what happens in, um, um, you know, in, in politics on daily basis mainly in Canada, but uh, also around the world. Um, so then some people might ask me why I chose, um, why I chose um, NDP as the party that I work for. Um, I say this always about Canada. Uh, I say like, for example, like when it comes about what I do or who I am, I say, well, they chose me because that's that's true. Uh, I am mostly of, um, well, maybe this is how I have to put it. Uh, politicians could be also activists. And we have some people in, 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 in politics, some people are more politician types and some people are more activist types. Those who are activist types are mostly um, um, either they, they organize people in different ways, they work for um, NGOs or unions and you know, just uh, try to get people organized and put pressure on politicians to pass a bill or something. But those who are politicians are mostly just th those front um, frontiers brands that carry on with the position. So uh, you could be a bit of both or it could be leading towards one. So I feel like I'm mostly um, an activist type, but I also want to uh, make big impacts. Uh, so um, I chose to be part of um, an opposition um, party, which exactly does what I want to be, I want to do for, for, for the society. So I want to work in a team that uh, keeps the uh, government accountable for what they claim they're going to do. Um, and I think that's what NDP does for uh, social democracy, which is technically what I call myself now. I mean, like, in terms of my ideology in politics, I'm a social democrat. Um, and what is a social democrat is mostly, um, I, I think for like many of you um, or may, all of you maybe know better than me, is just the kind of government that we're looking for. Um, well, there is a free market um, that's working on their own, and then we have this government who's um, getting ta gathering taxes and from those who are um, the richest, and then distribute it and give it to the part of the community and the society who are most vulnerable, like disabled people. And um, the MP that I work for is uh, uh, the critic. Um, has a critical role for disability inclusion. So disability is also something that I am involved with on day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, uh, you know, we have validators and real people with real stories that come to our office every day. Um, and now I think, um, how many minutes we're in? Can you tell me, remind me? Um, I think we're about 10 minutes. Okay, so now it's a bit more about how does your MP office work. In Canada, we have 338 MP offices, um, MPs in general. So every single writing, um, it's, it's based on population. There are 100K, around 100K constituents or people in one writing. Um, and... Um, some people ask me, like, is it different? Like how much money or resources you have if you are MP that works, I mean, under the name of the 
um, government party or like opposition party, you know, it's there is no difference because um, our offices, um, constituency offices, they provide um, services to people, and it's just hundred k of Canadians. Uh, so we, I mean, I say Canadians, not necessarily even citizens. So um, residents and uh, we all, they all deserve the same services. Um, around 363K dollars goes to every uh, office. Some roles like the prime minister, they get double amount of a normal, just a regular MP makes in terms of their salary. Uh, but our resources uh, are all the same. So we have same amount of money to spend on um, advertising, you know, everything uh, in the in the in the office. And every MP has two offices. One is in the constituency, uh, one is in the riding, which we call them constituency office, and one is in Ottawa. The ones that you know, reside in in uh, in in riding, what we do is just we help people with uh, on daily basis um, regarding some you know, some issues like any kind of issues that they could, they might have with uh, federal government offices or organizations like EI, CPP, like GIS, old age security, um, immigration problems. And so we have 1% in each office uh, dedicating their all time, just helping people. Um, and uh, that's on a daily basis. And then we have another, uh, role in the office, which is just administrative job, members assistant, and another one is me, average assistant. So I do the marketing part for MP. I'm um, responsible for making her or him, or I mean, if that that would be a he, um, a brand, um, and like I would say, um, average assistant mostly is marketing and. Uh, uh, public re relations, but also I uh, have some overlaps with parliamentary jobs too, depending on the situation. For example, if we are working on a bill that is related to my degree, they might ask for my help, like because I am interested in food security. Uh, when they're working for on a private member's bill to go to to take it to the floor, um, um, usually um, th that's that's going to be. They're going to ask me to help with, the, with developing the whole thing. Um, um, so there are other things that the office can do for you. I'm not sure how many of you know, knew this, but I didn't know until I got here that you can ask for certificates from your member of uh, parliament uh, for your milestones, like, for example, 50th anniversary or wedding anniversary, I mean, like, or I don't know, 19th, uh, 91st uh, birthday of your grandparents. That's also something very interesting that uh, I do on a daily basis for constituency year. You can get Canadian flag. So if you want to have a Canadian flag and you don't have it or you don't want to pay for it, you can get it from us. You can just drop by and get ones. You can get pins. Uh, you can, of course, you can ask your member of parliament to attend your events. Um, and um, yeah, even if you have any questions about the policies, you don't understand how this bill or that rules and policy works, you can definitely call and ask for an explanation. That's also part of our job. So it's interesting that when I am in the community and you know, at different events or festivals, uh, whenever we talk, we want to talk not whenever, but most of the time, when we talk to people, they they tell us, um, no, I cannot vote. Is this about voting? I cannot vote. No, constituency office is not about voting. We are not allowed to be partisan here. The, um, no matter what's your ideology or beliefs, uh, we have to give you the same services and uh, we don't promote our party or our ideology here is everyone is the same. And you you definitely have to go and ask for help when you've got any kind of issues with, um, you know, any federal government uh, institutions. Um, so this is constituency office. And then we have a parliamentary office in Ottawa. 
what the parliamentary office does is very um, different from what we do here. They're mostly focused on the parliamentary jobs. There is, and it's very unfortunate that um, Canadian democracy um, is is a, is a good one, but uh, because mostly um, we have this first past the post uh, system, electoral system, which means that you are going to get elected only when you have more votes and the government is formed by the, the party that has the higher number of seats taken. Um, the majority of, so technically um, those bills who are passed in the House of Commons are mostly only uh, coming from the parties that is governing. Uh, while in other countries, um, they, ha they have other electoral systems proportional and parties, they work together. So if even if you are a party that is not that does not have the highest number of seats, you still get a chance to pass bills. But in, in Canadian history, usually oppositions, they they don't they almost rarely or never um, they can take bills to the floor, knowing that it never gets passed. It, I think it happened only 14 times in the history of Canada that private members' bills or bills, technically bills from the opposition parties got um, passed. Um, and um, that's a big problem, I think, for our democracy because democracy is an index, means it's somewhere between zero and 100. And the more you go, let's say, towards zero, it's a dictatorship, towards 100, it's a perfect democracy that... Uh, represents so the government uh, represents almost everybody uh, in the um, in the society. Um, but now you know, for example, whenever uh, in federal level, I mean, um, when liberals form the government, it's just thirty percent of people. They're representing thirty percent of people. Uh, and when conservatives do that, it's just again thirty percent, and they're not that. So at every single time. A moment, uh, our government is not is not even representing fifty percent of uh, Canadians' ideology and beliefs. Uh, so that's something that uh, I hope uh, I can change one day. And if you ask me today, um, I would uh, I would prefer to work for um, a system or an organization who works on um, electoral system change uh, rather than a party, a specific party. But I so far I couldn't find a, <laughs> a job in that department. So yeah, and also your MPs, uh, they have, they they also, they are all part of different committees and these committees could be related to their critic roles uh, or just the ones that they, they, they just, they, it's their passion. Uh, they wanna be part of those committees. Um, um, they are also a part of association, different association and groups. Um, again, those are mostly just uh, some kind of networkings they have. Um, and uh, based on the critical role they have, or s the opposition party like conservatives, they, for example, if you have Ministry of Education, um, in um, that should be a liberal MP now, uh, and then conservatives, they have a shadow, um, shadow minister for that. It means that one office is observing that minister and uh, it's just criticizing them on a daily basis. Uh, and telling them what they do wrong. <laughs> um, and uh, in, in NDP a party, we have critic roles. So every, because we have only 25 NDPers, NDP MPs, every MP has different critical and critic roles. Like um, we have community infrastructure and um, disability inclusion. And so whatever that the government we think is doing wrong in that department, we focus on that, we write letters to them, we, take it to the media we try to keep them accountable for what they claim they're going to do um so i in general some people ask me like when i talk to people um either for election uh, when i'm door knocking or on daily basis people tell me that now that you're working with politicians do you think that they care or it's just a game of power um in general, I feel like um, it really depends on the personality of a politician, the politician. Like, it's not like that all politicians are uh, only playing this hunger hunger game, I mean, for, for power. 
um, lots of politicians have been activists before they got elected into office. Um, so I assume um, it really depends and you have to really know a politician uh, closely or you have to follow their work to know that how much they care or how much it's all about getting reelected or or just just uh, helping the 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 party forming the government is uh, it's it's very different from politician to politician and every I believe that every single party um, has good or bad politicians and uh, whether what's our beliefs or ideology um, you can find them in everywhere. Anyway, thank you. That's for it now. That's for me. And if you have any questions, I'm here to respond if I know the answer. Thank you very much, Melody. Uh, uh, thank you for being on time. Uh, there are a few people who joined us um, and I want to acknowledge them, giving them a chance to introduce themselves. Vida, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us what you do. Absolutely. Sorry, I was late. Uh, my name is Vida and I am adult learning educator uh, with the college. Awesome. Thank you. Sogol. Sogol. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, actually, I, um, yeah, my name is Sogol and I work at Success. I'm a link uh, instructor and a uh, um, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Muhammad Nadi. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I, this is Muhammad Nadi, and uh, I'm working uh, as a business intelligence developer. Yeah, I'm uh, joining uh, you from Montreal. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so before we get to Hawaiian's question, let's take a group photo. Everyone who wants to be in the photo, turn your camera on. I'm going to count three, two, one, and then I'm going to take a picture. Uh, looking forward to see all your faces, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm going to count now. I saw three, two, and one. Okay. Looks like it did the trick. Uh, okay. Um, now we go to Hawaiian. Hawaiian. Hello again. This is Hawaiian. So thank you very much, Melody, and congratulations for, first of all, the fact that I feel you have found what you're passionate about and you're doing what you really love and that's really cool and encouraging for someone like myself because second for those who do not my background is maybe kind of may become interesting for you specifically because i studied in iran like mohsen uh, mba I, my previous background was industrial engineering but when i came to canada i studied a master in public policy so I finished my master in public policy at SFU. Then I didn't finish at that point and studied a little bit by myself political theory. And two years ago, I decided to start a doctoral program in political science. Wow. Uh, so I studied a little bit political science as a doctoral student until technically Five days ago, I was a PhD student in political science at American University. But I've decided not to continue that program. We can have a program, another tech talk for that. <laughs> but let's put that aside. And I'm saying all this because you brought up the fact that you said you kind, you're kind of interested in studying and going back to school politics. Mm -hmm. As someone who has studied officially in public policy and political science, I have one recommendation for you. Just take it as a very personal opinion. Do not do that. And I would say whatever you are doing and what you are 
passionate about just do it in practice the studying mm -hmm. politics and public policy in the school in university is a totally different thing you start a academic program and you suddenly see oh wow there's no relationship whatsoever between what is taught at the school and what you practice and see in political offices and about policy making decision making politicians etc cetera, etc cetera. and it, it becomes somehow disappointing in that sense that's my experience and also i would say a lot of the other people who come to study politics and public policy at the school because they are passionate about politics but that's not the case and it's unfortunate but it's actually the reality of the field at at, at the moment yeah uh, we can talk a lot about that but i put that aside the other thing i wanted to say was about uh your experience about outreaching to people and to sort of door knocking my question is how did you feel in terms of the differences that people have and how they respond to your sort of outreach and your, uh, you know, uh, presenting them with what they, uh, what you are presenting about, you know, political interaction, voting, etc. Do you think somehow people are different in how they respond in terms of their background, their even whether they are quote unquote old school Canadians? or they are, for example, first generation, second generation or something like that, yeah. But yeah, thank you very much. That was kind of very interesting to me uh, because that's also something that I'm interested in. And you, taught, you talked also about uh, the sort of uh, shortcomings or caveats of democracy in Canada. I would suggest come to the United States and you will be a lot more happier about Canadian democracy. Yeah. So <laughs> I can say that. Uh, yes, yeah. thanks for your presentation. I will be listening. Thank you. And I uh, advise to everyone that uh, to, if they have a long remark to break it down into pieces and- uh, I take that. Thank you, Amir. <laughs> thank you. Melody. Sure. In terms of the first thing that you brought up is that it's just that um, I work now around politicians enough to know that like not every single politician is has expertise uh, after I mean, in terms of what they're doing, like you could be they try like, for example, if someone's the minister of health, let's say, well, it's likely that they're a doctor or something, but that even doesn't mean that they have the knowledge of how to develop bills or policies for that specific matter. Uh, I think um, after doing all this, I feel like um, when, when um, as, as a social democrat, when you talk with a liberal or when you talk with a conservative or green person, doesn't matter. Um, it's just, there's some very cliche uh, statesmen are out there. Like, for example, when you say, hey, I work for a critical role for, for MP that has a critical role for disability inclusion and disabled people really cannot, you know, just, just solve the problem. Some of them are born with the issue. So when they are uh, paid just only $1,200 a month uh, and the poverty line is... Uh, over two thousand dollars, there is no other way of getting that more money that they need uh, from the government. Get that budget and uh, get, kind of force the government um, just just to give that money and distribute that money to disabled people. So, um, and then conservatives would make this claim that how are you going to do that? Because then we have to pay more tax if you want to pay disabled people with more money. And then that needs kind of when we get here to this this part of com uh, conversation, then I you need references, you need statistics, you need um, strategies. Um, I can always say I, I will say this that distribution matters. Well, I'm paying thirty three percent of whatever I make goes to taxes, right? So how come today 
uh, I talked to an Iranian um, senior whose um, old age security was only $183 while he is renting a room. Uh, in a in a in an apartment and has to pay eight hundred dollars something. So he's got no money for medication. He's got no money for um, for for his rent. He's got no money for food. Nothing. It's just this guy should live on two hundred dollars. So um, distribution matters. That's the, that's just a general statement. But to, just to make it to, um, make it more practical, I think I need a bit of more knowledge. And that knowledge, I now I feel like I struggle. I need be, I need to know a bit of more of economics. Um, um, I don't know statistics and so and such and such. If you think that going to school doesn't work with that, then maybe I have to educate myself in other ways. Because uh, I'm also um, now I'm doing this practically, but uh, in uh, on the floor uh, in the field. But uh, I'm also kind of an academic person. That's uh, that's number one. And about door knocking, you asked me. Well. That's something interesting to, you should know that the most committed people to vote and keep our democracy alive are seniors. And it's uh, kind of a pity that uh, the government uh, doesn't really put much energy and money and you know anything for the seniors are in a very critical situation in this country and we're gonna be soon uh, a senior. I mean, not soon, sometimes we're gonna be all gonna be seniors if we, um, I mean, if you leave long uh, enough to become one, but um, I don't understand uh, that what, how come these people are so committed, are so ignored. Uh, so at doors, um, you can talk politics with uh, youngers as much as you want, but uh, they're not much into voting, which is kind of sad because you have a democracy because people vote. And if you look at the numbers, for example, in many municipality elections, mayors get elected by less than 30% of the votes of eligible people. Um, the last election in Ontario, the government was the government was formed with 12% of the eligible voter, the votes of 12% of eligible voters. And that's such a low number. So the government in Ontario does not represent 88% of eligibles. We don't know like in, in bigger scale, I don't know what's the number, but this is very low. Uh, so at doors, um, well, number one, a lot of Canadians do not vote. Um, um, and don't care and they're not because we are coming from a country that never had democracy. And we think that by default, Canadians should be more informed than Iranians about you know, politics. But unfortunately, uh, that's not true. Lots of Canadians do not have, I mean, when I say Canadians, it means people who were born here or, um, and um, maybe even Iranians are too much into politics because of the situations, crisis that we have over there. Um, and I feel like conservative people are mostly um, are more committed to vote uh, comparing to progressive and liberals in general. And that's another debate and that's another topic. Uh, so youngers, progressive, they've got opinions. They uh, they are mostly activist types. They don't want to, but they don't engage in politics much. Even um, even even voting is not. Uh, High, but um, it's not high rate. But conservative, um, conservatives and seniors are the mostly, uh, I mean, engaged people in politics. And what was the about I think, the democracy? Yeah, I guess yes. Melody, sorry to interrupt you. I guess uh, we can just let others because I guess I asked mm. too many too many questions. I guess based on the time I that think we so. have. I think that's it. I think Thank that's you very much to... for your comprehensive answer. Thank you very much. Sure. All right, Imran. Make it quick. <laughs> uh, thank you, Melody, for presenting this uh, wonderful uh, career path. It's, it's, it's a little invisible to people. Um, this is more of a comment. It's not a question from you, but you can comment on my comment. Uh, is that um, I share the same, I'm from Pakistan, it's the 
recently what's happening in Pakistan also you might you might hear I'm not going to go in detail it's almost the same thing so uh, but one one of the thing in last 18 years I have experienced is that neither I can um, get on the conservative side nor on the liberal I do not fit in but you have rightly pointed out that the system is such that the that one of the opposition becomes like um like a, so powerful that they only present the bills and that's very right and that's why i do not feel like inclusion in the democracy over here so that's just my comment you maybe you can verify that or comment further thank you very much melody sure i think that's uh, again uh, one of the things that i would like to work on in, in my own community and i hope that it helps even Mm, to to increase the awareness back in, in Iran too. It's just the fact that number one, we cannot exclude any ideology from any society. So people exist from far right to far left. And just um, bashing one group over another does not make sense. Um, and uh, so the any kind of government that you have when they present um more people in the in the society it's a better democracy right and um that's i mean the canadian uh, again backing to democracy index canadian has a better democracy than in terms of i mean um the efficiency of democracy it's better than us definitely or many other countries are definitely better than many dictatorship countries but also, it's not the best. We have better countries in this world, and they're they're practicing this better because they have more parties. Number one, so see in the U.S. you have just two major parties. At least in Canada, you have three, and uh, four uh, four different parties uh, get seats, which is better than what's happening in the U.S. But there are like countries in this world, like Norway, like their government is formed of nineteen different parties. And you might think, well, that's too much. No, um, honestly, it's not. Still, the, the one that gets the highest uh, you know, uh, number of seats, they have more power, but the power is also distributed. So, so and that's something that, yeah, when, so number one, everyone should be presented. So you're not, we, we cannot block anyone from far right to far left. This is the only thing that is, cannot we, we can we have to uh, block is fascism and terrorism beside that it's just your opinion you can express and as long as you've got the followers you, you just just you, you can just govern right um and yes so as i said um i think now it's time for in 2015 when trudeau uh, when Justin Trudeau uh, got into office, uh, he promised everybody to change the electoral system in Canada, and that didn't happen after three times. And uh, now he got uh, elected for three times, but that didn't happen. And unfortunately, that's the only party that can change this for us in Canada. And so, uh, as um, as someone who's another another party who represents social democracy, like liberals. Um, just a different type of social democracy on the spectrum. Um, but I think this is my right place because that's another reason why I'm here because we are the only party um, that um, keep them accountable in terms of social democracy and progressive beliefs while conservatives, they do push them to compete out uh, but um, them at elections, but well, of course they do not believe in electoral system change. Imran, do you have another question or your hand was up from before? Yeah, I raised my hand to get in the queue because I didn't want it to um, keep on speaking. Okay, um, in that case, let's go to... Okay, nobody else has their hand up, so I'm going to volunteer someone. Mehdi Vezvai, I know you have opinions. Mehdi? Mehdi doesn't. Okay. You don't have any questions yourself, Amir? I have a lot of questions, but I'm not gonna. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, ask mine for now. Uh, all right. Emran, right. you can go at. Looks like nobody's. Um, 
Melody, uh, you just mentioned about uh, the left and right. So <clears throat> what I'm worried about as an engineer in power generation company, and uh, what, I'm, what I'm worried about- Is it just me or is it uh, everyone else cannot hear him? Can, can you hear me now? I can hear. Okay. Can you hear me, Amir? I can hear. Uh, it's just you, Amir. Something's happening here. Um, Melody, guys, can you hear okay. me? Yeah, we can. I can hear you, Amir. We can hear everything okay. properly. Uh, I you cannot and hear Ryan anyone. Um, and each other. I think there's something. Yeah, Melody, so about the left and right, what, what worries me as an engineer is that right now in the world, especially in North America, uh, for last 30 to 40 years, the infrastructure is getting renewed. The bridges have to be made, the infrastructure has to be made, the critical power generation setups, oil and gas pipelines, everything has to be made. Um, Canada is really, really struggling in making sure that the engineering mindset and the people who uh, think for the renaissance of the industrial, um, industrial uh, economy, which guarantees the demo democracy, that's what I believe in, that is under threat, that mindset is under threat due to far left and far right forming. And that is exactly why how I feel excluded uh, because I wanna do right thing while the democracy uh, partially helps at the, at the common level. But since people are not educated and this time is very, very critical with regard to industrial renaissance, um, I believe I, I, I believe the thinking minds, which are the center, uh, which are the balance uh, gets excluded because now you have a decision based on uh, uh, who, who uh, on more people, not the people who are right. Because usually right people are in minority because they have the mindset of engineering, which is based on long-term logical, uh, logical outcome long term logical outcomes are not um, not uh, considered well in optics based um, optics based uh, short term uh, democracies that is that is my opinion that is why even democracies themselves around the world in in, in west in europe here are are kind of failing in infrastructure related uh, places but sooner or later they have to include the center which is um, which is uh, which is the engineering mindset, the thinking mindset, the uh, who does not consider left or right, who does not consider majority. I hope you agree. Uh, well, I'm trying to understand your viewpoint here. Uh, well, you said that the minorities are right because usually the the majority are kind of in center, like at least in Canada. Um, um, well, 30% of people uh, are liberal voters, but like around 70% of people are, they vote for a form of social democracy. That's just NDP, green and liberals are three different forms of social democracy. And each, uh, each party in some issues are a bit, you know, to the right or a bit to the left and 30% are, are voting for conservatives. So uh, when you say that, um, so you think that the far right and far left are kind of in charge and that's kind of impacting the practical so solution um, or is that what you mean? Uh, what, what, I, what I mean is that um, the right thing to do in the moment for the government, for example, decision of a pipeline, decision of a big refinery, uh, when you leave it to people for m getting the majority vote on that or based on anything, um, it gets carried away with how many people like that as an optics because not everybody is an engineer. You cannot explain it to people. Uh, hmm. And the definition of far left liberal and the far right is with regard to uh, populated uh, areas like cities, more liberals, and then 
countryside more more conservative that's that's that should not be the polarity in the system for the democracy it should be more of people and opinion based and individual based but since it's not it's not that uh, you you really do not have uh, educated opinion in canada and that is by 12% vote you, you you just already said i hope i don't I think I don't think I can convey that in one like sitting. It might be opening another subject. But thank you, Melody. I will I'll stop here. I'll stop here. Okay, yeah. sure. Then my question would be: uh, Do you think there is any other country that is doing this better? Uh, I I I I haven't I haven't seen that because I. It seems yeah. like United States, like presidential democracy. My uh, my idea that the larger geographic footprint of a country, you need presidential democracy. Uh, we have inherited this system from Commonwealth, like from United Kingdom, which is very small place, populated small. So it's like entire UK is a city. So they, the, you can apply parliamentary side democracy over there. But you need presidential democracy right down to municipality, the power of municipality and everything in a yeah. larger geographic area for, for actually to depolarize the system from this highly populated to countryside people kind of left right definition you know so so number one i want to say something uh, you you brought it up number one democracy is not a perfect system so democracy is our understanding of you know the best um in terms of the philosophy uh that uh, and human brains has developed up to certain amount and this is the best that we could come up with so it doesn't it has a lot of problems, and that's one thing. Like everyone ha can vote, but necessarily not everyone has the same amount of political, uh, you know, um, education, right? So they don't know what they're and they, and as you said, it could and the whole election could be carried away from uh, what it's supposed to be. So this is the best we have for now. Uh, and as I said, for more practical ways, we have to come up with an electoral system that parties work together for people and they're not focused on getting elected and having the power because I'm now in the system. Um, I feel like lots of our energy and money and budget goes towards how to get elected. It doesn't go towards what people need because if you don't get elected, you have zero power. With zero power, you can do nothing. Well, it's when it's proportional with the number of, I mean, you can always work to get more seats, but no matter like, first of all, people are going to vote for whoever they believe. And then um, the more seats you have, the more power you have, but you still have power, right? So that's something else. And again, in terms of engineering, as you said yourself, it's also a matter of municipality level. So that's why we have now three levels of government here. Mm, lots of the things that you're mentioning is uh, is not even a federal level uh, jurisdiction. It's, it's municipality, and in municipality, most of cities it's not even partisan. So it's not about. It is also about part left and right, but we have lots of um, politicians, like councilors and mayors, that they're kind of mixed, and they 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 are looking for practical solutions because. Um, because it's it's a level of government that people are going to see the results on daily basis, the traffic, the transportation system, you know, housing, um, so urban planning is, is um, so I feel like number one, change the electoral system. Number two, uh, change good politicians, uh, those who have expertise in urban planning or any kind of planning and project management for your municipality level. And that's again where we have to educate people because the municipality election is usually has the lowest rate among all three levels. That's that's something that I can comment that. Thank you, uh, Melody. Um, uh, at this point, we usually ask our um, uh, guests to think about what our takeaway should be. So we get back to you at the end of the meeting with that. Sogol, you had your hand up, but then it's not up. Yes. Uh, so Melody, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I, as you know, I don't know much about politics, but I'm into it, into learning it. So uh, my question is actually about door knocking, which I'm so excited to do it with you next week. I'm still in San Diego. Sorry about that because of my that situation. So my question is that this is kind of new to me. 
So is it like a common way of uh, supporting a candidate? Have you done it before? And is there any other way that we can uh, support Shervin, like by emailing uh, people or sending them texts to encourage them to vote for him? Uh, well, uh, Amir is also an expert in this uh, matter. Well, um, well, you wouldn't know because we we come we come from a place that I mean our, our hometown, uh, our home country. Uh, in the the, gay, the way that the people get selected is very different. Even um, but when, whenever I mean I, I did search this because I was like this is a very traditional way. Uh, mm -hmm. But even in India. Uh, the democracy. I mean, that's how they they collect the votes. They go door to door and talk to people. I know this is it needs lots of manpower. Uh, but if you if you don't get, I mean, if you don't get elected, um, I mean, if you want to get elected, um, that's the only way to go. Unless you are such a big brand, like mm -hmm. like you are a celebrity, you are someone that in politics or I don't know, even like, uh, who was that guy who got it like the SD in the US? Remind me, Arnold, that, that was him? Oh yes, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, yeah. right? So okay. either, unless you're, you're, you're a brand like him and then, then people vote for, you know, because, because you're a celebrity, otherwise uh, you have to go out there and talk to people one by one mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that they know about who you are, what you stand for. Uh, and that's the that's where the majority of vote comes from. From social media, you got not much. Mm -hmm. And if you are part of a party, then you're gonna have the standard. Usually, you're gonna you know you're gonna get this amount of you know votes. But for the rest to become to to win, then you really need to go out there and talk to people. Mm -hmm. The day of actions, rallies, they all matters. Being seen in the community matters, but. As far as I know, the more door you knock on, the the, the, the likelihood of getting yeah. elected goes higher. That's the guarantee. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Any other question, guys? Awesome. Uh, somebody had their hand up. I missed it. Oh, Mehdi, go ahead. Hey, Melody. Uh, so um, I was in a place I couldn't speak at that time. Sorry, Ramir. Uh, my question is like, I want to go back to the whole politics and our home country and the fact that we're in Canada now. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a point of view and I want your comments on it. So I think uh, our community is a little bit different than one of the two major minority, uh, you can say, which is the Chinese and the, the Indians. And okay. that is the fact that these two communities, when they uh, um, migrate, to, uh, migrate to Canada, they have to forfeit their passports, okay, when they became citizens. And that is the fact that, like, when you are starting that journey, you know that you will end up being Canadian and you are letting go your nationality as you were born. But now, for the Iranians, there's splits, I can say, in 100 ways. The people that are forced to uh, immigrate, people that just immigrate, to get a passport and go back. You have people that uh, they just look into the economy and all that kind of a thing. So encouraging our community, especially Iranian community to be engaged in politics, that's one of the key issues that no one, we don't have the same goal. The goal is not that to become Canadian and to be route, rooted into the, in this country. So, and because of that, uh, there's really those, I think only like those people that actually have migrated to, to Canada, which meaning that they have let go their own country per se and say, I want to move to somewhere else that I can evolve to another thing and a bit of thing that I think of. And then they come here and see, okay, this is good. 
but it has some issues. So now I want to be participating in the politics to make it a little bit better. And because I, my point is, these people that have this mindset is so little in our community that technically you will not have an engagement in any other politics in any three levels of government. Um, okay, thank you. I don't know. If, if, is this your point of view as you are in the heart of the politics as well, or no, this is just So I can else? share my own experience because I am now on daily basis for eight hours every day, Monday to Friday, I'm dealing with, uh, with people who uh, come here from different communities and uh, the way that in, they interact with us, because like as, as an outreach person, I have to um, get engaged with different communities, right? I have to be engaged with Koreans, Filipinos, Chinese, Indians, Iranians, all of them. Um, so the, the fact that you brought up uh, about the passports, uh, number one, I didn't know that, uh, but uh, I don't think that's the key issue here. I think the key issue here is that um, how, I mean, the way that you were brought up in your childhood and the way that the, 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 the culture works. For example, you might be all guys surprised, but Iranians uh, approach us the most also because they have immigration issues. I mean, that, that's, that's the community that has the most uh, immigration issues and 99% of uh, our case works are Iranians with immigration issues. But let's say with, um, with Chinese people, the, the voting rate is a lot lower than us. So the amount of safety that they feel like here, even in a, in a democracy, they don't feel safe even to vote. And one of the reasons that I, I did I did a bit of research on this is that, well, Chinese is the second ally, economic ally of Canada, right? Imagine if the Iranian government was like that for Canada. Uh, we don't have even an embassy, and sometimes we don't feel safe uh, because we feel like Iran people who are associated are here. Uh, so they don't even feel safe to come to the MP office and ask for help uh, wow. when they have issues. So of course their uh, voting rate is very low, and when you are door knocking, you can you can understand that they don't want to they don't want to talk about this at all. It's just a shh. While Iranians are not like that, they're very opinionated um, in social media and at the doors. But the reason that they don't they don't want to get involved. I mean, number one, they don't feel. I don't. Want, I don't want to say they're not responsible. It's just this is not politics. Number one is a dirty matter. That that's the sentence we always say, right? Just to stay away from politics. That's how you were brought up, and you think politicians are all lawyers. And so, I'm not saying again. All of us, I'm just saying that we are kind of very passive um, politically because of the way that we were brought up and the, the way that our society works. And um, mostly Iranians are uh, into science and engineering and that social science part is not promoted by the government, is not promoted by our, um, in our culture. They feel like, they, I mean, those who have low IQ go and uh, study, I don't know, so social science or political science, which is not true. It needs a lot of intellectuality. So unlike here, that at schools, it's very promoted, right? So um, I don't feel like it has something to do with that passport issue that you brought up. It's mostly related to the fact that um, what kind of culture we are in, what kind of uh, government we had. And um, now that we are here, um, like, um, why are we here? Mostly we are here just because we are fed up and now we want to carry on with the life. Uh, we don't want to, if you, you're like, if you wanted to make changes, you would do it back in Iran, right? So, um, so, so that's my understanding. That's my understanding that, but I have lots of hopes for Iranians in, in a specific, as a, uh, because I feel like when they also have this academic mindset, when something makes sense, they accept and they follow. It's just, you have to find a way to make politics fun. When you do that part, 
they get engaged very much. And number another thing that I want to mention, social media is not a good representation representation of our community or any other community. Because now I've been around enough to know that because and I do the social media for the member of parliament. Uh, those loud people who scare you away or, I mean, scares lots of people away from politics or a specific kind of politics or parties or ideology, um, they, in real life, the number is not like that. You, when you do or knock again, you, you get a better sense of, uh, you know, who we are or every ethnic community or how, how they interact with politicians and how open-minded or closed-minded they are. Oh, thank you. Awesome. All right, we have 15 more minutes, so. Can I make a quick comment, Amir? You may. Sure, sure. Thanks. So it's interesting that you brought up the political culture and differences between, for example, Chinese community and Iranians. Something is, uh, which was interesting to me that when I found it uh, is that uh, in East Asian cultures, the Confucius culture, which in Farsi we say Confucius, uh, the, the, the work of government, the rule, is delegated to experts. It's a very um, consolidated belief in, in Confucius culture that ordinary people do not have a say or should not have a say in how they are ruled. This is what uh, experts, those who are uh, have more knowledge, more educated, they are in better position in, in, in they're more legitimate to do that. And it's interesting how we as ordinary Iranians are always judgmental about what our politicians do, what how they are making policies, and we allow ourselves that this is something that we can have some opinion about. As you said, Melody, that Iranians are very opinionated in that sense. But naturally, East Asian people are less opinionated because culturally they think this is not appropriate for them. It is something that if you want to be a politician, if you want to make a law, you have to be in a different class, in different setting, in different, you know, educational level. And that's a very different thing between us. And we can see that in our, you know, multicultural communities as you just talked about as well. Yeah, and exactly that's how we how we create dictatorships, right? <laughs> so because we're not involved, and the job is just defined to be just just to be uh, to, for those who either they are in it or their their parents are in it, you know. Um, so exactly. So that was my very, my very initial comment that I got into this because I felt the desperation um, of my people. And I mean, of Iranians not knowing how to solve the problem. Um, and I thought the only reason that we can do this is to make politics fun and for everyone. Mm -hmm. And every single person, I mean, let's say eight, nine millions of Iranians are living outside of the country. And this could be applied to other communities as well, because now I know uh, there is an association, there is an, an NGO here uh, um, working on a Chinese uh, civic engagement. Mm -hmm. So this is not just us, it's not a, our problem. So I think that the way that we can do it, we are all living in a democracy. So this is ju this is just an academy we're living in our life. And how about like one million of us try to learn democracy and then teach everyone else could teach just 20 people back in Iran. And then it's going to be part of, you know, like, like, I don't know, calculus. All of us know a bit of calculus. All of us know a bit of biology or chemistry, right? Because we got high school diploma. How many of us know how democracy works? And from far right to far left, um, different parties or ideologies like liberalism, neoliberalism, social democracy, what they stand for. And then when you do that, uh, I mean, that's, that's my solution. You might not find it practical, but I think uh, if we try that, in a, I mean, if we focus on that, and I feel like we are going towards that because now we are at, at, a, at a point that people like, okay, there is no solution. So uh, they're thinking, they're, they're looking for new ways, right? And they're trying new ways to solve their, their problem. Um, 
I think if we have enough people to get educated, even if, not not a lot, you don't need to read lots of books. Just just have a just read about it. Just have a ten pages, <laughs> you know, handbook about how democracy works. Um, then I think that we're gonna have we're gonna have some intellectuals and uh, political leaders um, in that have the ability to organize people and uh, you know work towards uh, a permanent solution. Yeah, exactly, absolutely. Yes, thank you very much, Melody. I hope we can stay connected. And uh, my apologies sure. because I have to leave now, and I was really. Happy Thank to be you. in this really interesting evening with you. Thank you very much, Amir Thank and Mohsen and all Same of here. you guys. My pleasure. Hey. Have a good one. Well, Imran has his hand up, but before we go to Imran, I want to hear something from someone else um, because um, we want uh, others, uh, we want different people to have the opportunity to express their opinion. Uh, if you don't volunteer, I'm going to volunteer you. Uh, Scary. The first person I see on the left to the left of the screen is Paymon. Paymon, jump in. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I was listening to the conversation. Uh, there is some, I think what I can hear is some kind of generic things, generic subjects, which uh, what I was thinking about during the conversation is what we can do it's it might be better idea to discuss that what we can do what is our capability what we're able to do instead of talking about the big 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 politics and uh just i don't know criticizing what government does is correct what is incorrect and this kind of thing which in my experience that never worked because we all the time say that, okay, this shouldn't be like that. This shouldn't be like that. But nobody knows that it should be like what exactly. So <clears throat> most of the people, they know what they don't want. But many people, they don't know what exactly they want. So uh, I think at this point, which what you do, Melody, working in the, in the office with the politician people, Maybe that might be a good idea to talk about some small things which we can do, like what Amir did for Farsi RBC or any of those things that we can do in our small community. So when we take that step and we can do something, even a small, but we can do, I mean, goals should be doable, so it should be measurable. Once we can do that, then I think that's the time to go to the next step now. That's the time to go to the next step, next step, talking about the bigger things. Uh, I don't know why <clears throat> we're here to hear about, I don't know, we're here to figure out how the government works, how the politic parties working, or how does that work? I thought that we're here to talk about what we can do for our, our small community and how some people like Melody can help while they're working uh, in some kind of governmental offices and uh, what we can use from her connection to the government. So that's my point of view. I prefer talking about these kind of things instead of the very general topics. Okay. Thank you for your comment. So uh, the, the, the topic was how does your MP office work? So that was the that was the initial because um, don't think that everyone in the in the society, even those who were born here, know how their politics and their demo Canadian democracy works and like what an office can, what a constituency office can do for them. Like uh, we have Canadians who came here like three generations ago, but they have then they have a problem with BC housing. They come to us, which is not our jurisdiction, right? So um, I spent a bit of time explaining why I got into politics. And part of it was uh, Iran and, and the political situation of Iran. And then um, I explained how the whole federal government works and the parties work and how MPs get elected and how what the constituency office can do for people. And so, then, I, yeah, so that, that so that was the major topic. But uh, in in relation to what we can do, number one, we can promote voting. 
That's the most important part because if you're not responsible enough as an adult living in a democracy just to take a few minutes and vote, it's likely that you're not going to get into any kind of organizations or, you know, like Farsi RBC or other NGOs uh, to, to work for the community. So that's number one thing that I think we have to work and that should be my, our number one priority in Iranian community in Canada, promote voting and at least bring the average uh, vote rate of Canadian Iranians close to the average whole community, I mean, like whole English community. Um, and at, the, at this time, we have to improve it around 60 to 70 percent. It means that, for example, if in uh, municipal level, if the um, engagement is 35 percent, it means like the whole community was 35 percent of eligible vote. Iranians are 10 percent. Yeah. Sorry for interruption, but again, I think this is not what I can understand what your MP does. What I'm looking for is what exactly MP does, what kind of help she or he can do for the society. I mean, these are the methods that, okay, we're going to the election. These are helpful. That's fine. But can you specifically name a couple of things that uh, MP can help people with? I'm not sure if you were here from the beginning of the session, yeah. but like, for example, the member of yeah, parliament. We're talking about the disability people, but again, this is, uh, this is just what you think and you haven't done anything. I mean, what, what I mean, you is not you as a melody. So you haven't done anything yet. These are the things that you're thinking about and you think that, okay, if we do this, 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 that would be great for society, but what I'm asking is what is the current authority of MP that she or he can do right now, not the future plans? Um, this is a very generic question, but the constituency office of MP uh, is supposed to answer all your questions regarding how the go federal government policies work and the services that they provide is regarding federal jurisdiction like EI, so or GIS, o, or OAS, or passport services, or national student loans. These are the things that services that we provide to constituents. So on daily basis, for example, if you have a problem with your pension and you cannot get an answer from the government agencies, you come to a MP office. That's, that's, uh, that's something. And then uh, all well, there are other things we do. For example, um, we help people to locate services. Um, we, uh, we provide them with you know, greetings if they ask for it. And as, as a member of parliament, you are, you are supposed to attend uh, constituents' events if they, if they ask you to attend. You have to try to accommodate. Um, that's part of the constituency office work. And the parliamentary work is different. That's where the, the bills comes and the committees, and that's, that's where the policies form. And then we talked about the fact that, unfortunately, because in Canada, we have first passed the post-electoral system, only the bills that the government MPs take to the floor pass through. In the history of Canada, only 14 bills, uh, private members' bills that oppositions offered and brought to the floor passed. So we, we think that we need a major uh, change in our electoral system. And this goes, uh, I mean, this offer goes by the MP to the member of our parliament. How to change the electoral system? Yeah, to make any change to the system. The change, so the way that democracy works, um, you have a house of commons or parliament that that pass bills, but at the same time, you have NGOs, activists, and people's lobbies in the, in the, in the society that advocate for a specific issue, right? Yeah. For example, now in Canada, uh, single seniors, this is very funny, single seniors pay more tax than couples, those couples that are seniors. 
which is funny because single seniors either they lost or got uh, their their um, partner or uh, got divorced they have less amount of resources right so you don't have to ask more tasks this is just yeah. a single issue but this single issue no not necessarily politicians do not know even about all the issues that we have as individuals we know our problems and then we have to get organized and usually mm -hmm. we do it in a form of organizations ngos we get members we mobilize people and then there are a certain number of people like let's say five thousand people we have this problem we go to the member of parliaments that are critic have critic roles for that mm -hmm. specific issue and then we lobby and to lobby is the kind of a bad word in Iranian culture, but honestly, that's that's a very official position. Some people are registered as lobbies and they're official lobbyists and uh, they they get meetings with different ministers or critic roles or MPs. And uh, they kind of try to bring a bill to the uh, floor uh, by those MPs or they if they don't listen, they take it to media. They make a big deal out of it. And they bring it to the point that either the opposition forces the government to do it or the government just just do it because otherwise there's going to be a loss of complaints or they might lose votes and lose the power. Thanks. Sure. Awesome. Uh, yeah. In terms of what the MP can do for the um, uh, for the community, they can uh, their advocacy matters and sometimes. Um, can make a difference and uh, they can be a voice for their community. Sometimes MPs are just mem representing their party in their constituency, but there are MPs that represent their, uh, there are a lot of MPs that represent their constituency to the federal government. And I think that matters uh, and in terms of uh, uh, the issues that come up that they that the federal government may not be aware of it. Those are the uh, things that they can be instrumental. Um, we're all out of time, but Imran, if you can make it quick, uh, I let you just uh, sit, have the last word or uh, comment. Thank you very much, Amir. I want to come back on the point where uh, there was uh, there was something mentioned about Iranian embassy not being here, and Iranian people feel a little excluded out of the out of the mainstream of Canada and might not be might not be able to include themselves in the political system. I just want to give them a trade-off. Um, brothers and sisters, this is our country. This Canada is our country. We came here, now this is our country. So learn this country, travel this country, breathe this country, live in this country, meet as many people. Do not, do not, uh, do not consider that I have to always talk with someone who speaks and speaks the culture and actually synchronize with the fear pattern or belief map of my own uh, background. So here is the difference. The people who have a diaspora like big, uh, big countries, they, they have advantage, but at the same time, they're stuck with their own community. They might not have that chance of taking themselves out of the of, out of the city and learn Canada the way you can. So use your vulnerabilities, channel them. And I totally agree. And I'm, I feel a little bit guilty that I never voted. I never voted in my entire life, Melody. But as you said, um, I should vote. And consider the way Jordan Peterson challenged uh, Bill C-67 and also Bill, Bill C-69 something for freedom of speech. Consider that you have to be part of part of that. <clears throat> yeah, we are if the you people, don't want, you cannot complain, is, right? If you don't yes. want, you cannot complain. Be Absolutely. C 11 year, I think you're referring to. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Ma. Yeah, Ma I'm going to finish. And Melody, I would love you to say something uh, as a last word rather than me, the last word. No, I'm not the last word. You are the last word. And I and I honestly want to ask you if you can come again, uh, uh, because this is not enough. This is not enough. It sounds politics is a, is a favorite uh, subject, Amir. Thank you very much. I, I, I first prefer to hear from everyone else who wants to say something. If if uh, they have any takeaway from our uh, conversation, I really appreciate that. And then 
I'll, I'll say my last words. Anybody has the last word? And the floor is yours. Melody. Okay, do you, Amory, do you have anything? No, thank you. It was great uh, and uh, I enjoyed it. And we're always great uh, yeah. in the community. So my last word is that the only reason that I started this is because I wanted to learn how to organize and mobilize people for different issues um, within Canada and within everywhere in the world. So after I left my country, there are many problems that I know that many people after, as uh, Emran said, when you leave your country, you might still be very focused on st stuff that's happening in your country. But if you travel and if you experience and you be more open-minded, um, you, you see that lots of your problems, many people are, are, are suffering from uh, across the world. So maybe the solutions to those problems is not even, even within the borders of your country. And you have to um, you have to think twice, and you have to have a, a like bigger horizon about how we solve the issues. Uh, so the only reason that I'm doing all this is that I want to learn how to find issues, or when I have I have I want to learn and teach how you find an issue, you you're experiencing a problem in your life. Mm how you can enable people to get together. And that's democracy, right? So NGOs also are uh, democracy based because they have border of directors and they have members and they all together works or unions also. They're all works towards a specific uh, a goal and how you can um, empower people and how you can, um, how, how you can reform the whole regime or government that you have um, towards what works best for everyone and uh, towards, um, um, towards having um, a system, political system um, that represents um, the majority of people so that they don't feel left out, excluded, or uh, suppressed. So that's that's something oppressed. That's something that um, I think that that's that's something that we are suffering uh, from in, in Iran too. And many many now that I do this, I'm I'm involved with lots of communities. You usually come go to another country. Not always. You usually go uh, when you have big big political issues back in your country. And uh, so, and I feel this is the only way that we can solve the problem. We have to encourage individuals to be part of um, a bigger system. And that system could be an NGO, could be a party. Uh, people have to learn to spend a bit of their time and energy and even money um, to um, to be part of uh, decision makings, and they have to, um, and we can educate them to to care. That's why I'm doing this, and uh, the rest is just you know, it's just. Um, I mean, the, the, that's the rest is not really. I mean, the, the, well, this is my job. I make money out of it, um, uh, but. Um, that's not the main reason because, of course, I could make money from many other ways, many, many other ways. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for coming uh, tonight. Thank you, Melody. Uh, it was great. Uh, always a pleasure to have you making a difference in our community. Uh, Mohsen, who's, who's on next week? Uh, Mahdi Zafarmand is our next guest. Uh, he's uh, from Ontario and uh, he's working uh, in Google. And it's going to be online, I presume. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, good to see you all. And uh, please follow Tech Talk on Facebook, Instagram, Telegram, uh, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And uh, YouTube. And YouTube. Yeah, the videos. And YouTube, are yeah. Lots of, lots of links. The <laughs> videos. The, the video of this meeting and the other meetings are going to be on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Perfect. And uh, yeah, see you next week. Thank you very much. See you soon, guys. Take care. Thanks Thank for you, having Melody. me. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me.